Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter or of course you can subscribe to the channel Let's Talk Boxing. Let's talk about Amir Khan and his fight against Kell Brook. It has been announced for early next year and I cannot wait. I know, I know, I know. A lot of you are out there going, Chris, are you kidding, man? This is past his sell-by date. It's been what, five, six, seven years out of date? Forget that, Chris. No, 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 no. I'm not having that. I can't wait. The presser today was quality. Listen, I was always a fan of wrestling as a kid, right? And we understood that wrestling was sports entertainment. And yet, when a fighter of old, a great fighter of the past, say Hulk Hogan was to return to challenge whoever was the current champion at that time, you understood that Hulk Hogan couldn't do what he used to do athletically. You knew it. But you still, as a kid, bought into the theatre of it, the excitement of it, the rivalry, the beef that was happening. And that was sports entertainment. So in a real fight where there's real needle. How can you possibly not want to buy into this? Imagine these were two fighters operating at domestic level who had never been to the mountaintop. They'd never been on the mountaintop and had never had to decline as a result. They're 24 years old. But they're at the level that Khan and Brook are at now. And they have this level of needle and this level of history. You're not going to want to watch that fight. So in some way, you've got to ignore the fact that they have certain declining assets as part of age-related decline, shall we say, and look at the fact that they are still both guys who understand the sport, very skillful. Yes, physicality declines, but the understanding of boxing and your knowledge and what you uh, are able to set up and things like that, little traps you can set, the understanding of these things doesn't just disappear because you've gotten older. You're just merely incapable of doing certain athletic things that you used to be able to do. So who do I think has the advantage going into this fight? Well, this is quite a tricky question, and I'll tell you why. On paper, Kell Brook has the advantage. Kell Brook has a specific style which doesn't age as badly as Amir Khan's. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Amir Khan has a series of skills which are reliant on the athlete being youthful. Speed, uh, the ability to overwhelm an opponent with volume. Okay, that's stamina related, the ability to be in and out and stuff like that. You are overwhelmed by what appears to be like a force of nature, speed, 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 constant pressure. These things are what Amir Khan used to do when he was at his best. As he ages, however, those assets decline. They are depreciating assets, physically speaking. Well, Amir Khan was never a guy who was a technician, not really. So if you can imagine Amir Khan, who is not the most durable guy in the world, who doesn't have a steel chin, an iron chin, if he becomes more of a sitting duck and he's not in and out as quickly, he's easier to time, he's easier to be able to find a home for that, for that big shot that you throw on that chin, right? So it's a depreciating, a group of depreciating assets. Whereas a guy like Kell Brook, his assets were more about timing, punching power, the understanding of distance control, shot variation, these are things that do not decline at the same rate. We're both once at the top of the mountain. They've begun their descent, but perhaps Amir Khan is falling towards sea level at a much faster rate. Nonetheless, there are other things you need to think about when it comes to this fight. Fascinating things that might make you think, oh, maybe Amir Khan's going to do this. First and foremost, Kell Brook's style isn't completely free of uh, the danger of decline. One of the criticisms that a lot of Ingle Gym fighters get and I do not share this criticism of the Ingle Gym. They say that these fighters, they, when they pull out, they pull out with their chins up high. And this is a criticism that occurred mainly from Tony Bellew and, and a number of others after Galahad was stopped by Kiko Martinez. And while it's true that they can sometimes pull out with a chin up, they're doing it because they're trying to turn the chin away. They're leaning away from a shot. Vitaly Klitschko did this. Muhammad Ali did this. Vladimir Klitschko did this. A lot of fighters do this. It's just a style that's relying on you maintaining distance control with uh, the ability to read an opponent and having the reflexes to just lean out of the way of a shot. Cambosos at times was doing this at the weekend against Tiafimo Lopez and he was doing it expertly. Had he not had the foot speed, had he declined physically, he may have not been pulling out as quickly. And as he's pulling out, he could get caught with a shot on the way out. Well, we actually saw Kel Brook suffer from this when he moved up a little bit to uh, 154. 
So this isn't a limitation necessarily of the Ingle style per se. It's just that the Ingle style has one particular thing which relies on fluidity and athleticism. Now that particular aspect, once that athleticism dwindles, you're more likely to get caught. I believe it was when he fought Zarafa. That particular guy gave some problems to Kell Brook because of the height and reach advantage. Kell couldn't make 147 anymore, he was saying. And this was back in, what, 2018? So this is a long time ago now, right? Almost, it's going to be three and a half years between that, occur that, that fight and this fight. So that's something we're going to come on to in a moment. But when he was pulling out, because Zarafa had this long reach, as he's pulling out, what would usually enable him to maintain range? That distance wasn't quite right. And he was getting caught as he's stepping out. Now, that was a problem with reach. But reflexes play a role in that. That distance control of coming in and getting out quickly. And that's a problem that Kell Brook could potentially face the older he gets, right? Well, against Amir Khan, who is not as fast as he used to be, but I'm going to assume he still has some sort of hand speed there. And he is, you know, he, he is quite rangy. Is Kell Brook going to be getting caught as he's pulling out? The other thing I want you to think about is something that was occurring in the press conference itself. I want you guys to read between the lines. Remember on this channel, we don't just do technical breakdowns. We want to read between the lines. We think of angles perhaps that other channels might not have thought of because we're always trying to dissect what is really being said. And when Kell Brook's father was speaking about facing Amir King Khan, he was saying that he really holds Khan responsible for the trajectory that Kell Brook's career took. Now let's talk about this for a minute and I'll tell you exactly why this is significant and it could actually work against Kell Brook. Kell Brook was a wonderful fighter, I really do believe that. A terrific talent. He was nicknamed the special one for a reason. He was a brilliant, brilliant welterweight. One of the best in the world in his time. He had a brilliant performance against Showtime Sean Porter. He dealt with Sean Porter in a manner that up until that point, nobody had ever dealt with Porter. And to be honest with you, since then, you could only argue that uh, uh, Crawford has dealt with him. And that was his last ever fight. So he's walked away. That was the twilight of his career. Prior to that, and, you know, nobody, nobody, you'd have to say, dealt with Sean Porter in a way that Kell Brook did. It was a wonderful performance. And yet, he didn't go on to have the career that many people felt he would have. Instead, the next fight was Jojo Dan, then came Frankie Gavin, then came Kevin Bizier, guys that were not considered to be of the level of Kell Brook. Those were fights, that period, those years there in 2015 and 2016, where he could really have gone after the world's best welterweights and he could have built up a real legacy. Instead, there seemed to be this constant flirting with Khan. Is the fight going to happen? Is it not going to happen? People were on the Kell Brook train. He's going to do Khan. Then Kell Brook, then Amit Khan put in that amazing performance against Devin Alexander. And everyone was like, wow, man, I don't know how this is going to go. Can he really deal with that level of speed and those combinations? And the world was pining for that fight. It never came. But here is why this is significant. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Kell Brook. Kell Brook, a man who would have felt at the time that he could conquer the world. He's taken the titles off of Sean Porter. He wants the biggest names and the best. But he knows the really big legacy fight and money fight is Amir Khan. Amir Khan is there, promising we're going to make this fight happen. The negotiations begin. They don't go to plan. They hadn't been to plan before. But it always seems to be this indication that they're closer than they've ever been before. Kell Brook is frustrated, but Eddie Hearns there is telling him, Kell, we're going to make this fight. Trust me, stay patient. Khan is telling him, beat this particular guy. Beat Matthew Hatton. This was way before, by the way, right? Beat Matthew Hatton. You beat Matthew Hatton. Uh, go and win a world title. He goes and wins a world title, beat Sean Porter. We'll make the fight happen. Uh, no, you've got to build up your name. There was constant moving of the goalposts. But it always felt like he was an inch away from grabbing the fight. In retrospect, Brook should have just said, you know what? Forget this dude, man. I'm going to go and carve my own path and my own legacy. He doesn't want the fight. Because Khan was dangling that carrot and then just pulling it away at the last minute, Kelbrook was always reaching for it, not taking risks to build his career. And eventually he got into a position where there wasn't that much on the table for him. And along comes Eddie Hearn. And Eddie says to him, Kel, here is your opportunity at greatness. Forget Amir Khan. Amir Khan, obviously, he's got his own plans and stuff like that. Gennady Golovkin, the unbeatable 
so to speak, machine. One of the best middleweights of all time. That's how people are already speaking about him, Kel. Imagine you go up. You go up and you take the scalp of Gennady Golovkin. We'll bring it over here in the UK. You've got nothing to lose, by the way. If you lose to Gennady Golovkin and you give a good account of yourself, your stock's going to rise. You went up to middleweight from welterweight and you gave this monster a real test. This is your legacy, Kel. This is greatness. I'm offering it to you on a platter. Do you want the fight? Yeah, give me the fight. He takes the fight. The first round, he nearly gets his head taken off. He then finds a rhythm and he has some terrific moments moving around and letting go of combinations. A lot of people would go on to criticize Gennady Golovkin for taking this fight. But the truth is that just shows you the level of greatness that Kel could have achieved had he won this fight. The truth be told, Gennady Golovkin deserved praise rather than criticism for beating Kel Brook. Carmen Basilio, for instance, wasn't the bigger man. He, he went up from welterweight to middleweight to fight Sugar Ray Robinson. And the first fight was very controversial. People felt that uh, Basilio won and there was a rematch. Nobody holds all this stuff against... And the rematch was a close fight too. Nobody holds this stuff against Robinson. Instead, it adds to his greatness because you understood that Carmen Basilio was a great fighter too. Whereas with Kel Brook, there was almost an undermining of him. So as good as he was... Had he beaten Golovkin, the legacy would go through the roof because the reason your name, your reputation gets built up is when you overcome obstacles. Look at the love that Cambosos is getting now for beating Teofimo Lopez. All of a sudden, right? A couple of days ago, he was a bum that was going to get knocked out in three rounds. We've gone from that to, wow, man, Cambosos is a warrior. That's the sort of swing that can occur in public opinion. So Kelbrook went for that. He reached for the stars. But the damage he accrued would mean he would never be the same again. He gave a fantastic account of himself against Errol Spence too. On another night, he may have won that fight. He didn't. His eye, the other eye this time, had been broken again. His eye socket in the 11th round after a fantastic start. So when you look at Kelbrook and his career, what you see is some very good wins against the likes of Carson Jones, Senchenko, uh, of course, Sean Porter. And then you see him fighting a bunch of guys who are not at his level. And when he really went for greatness, he fell short. Whether it was Golovkin, Spence, or way past his best against Terence Crawford. He holds Khan responsible for that. If only you told me you really didn't want to fight. Just say it, man. I wouldn't have had to have gone through this. I could have built a legacy. I wouldn't have had people telling me, why did you spend your time fighting mandatories against guys like Busy, Busy Air and Jojo Dan? Why did you fight Frankie Gavin? Kel Brooks underachieved in his career. The special one, he underachieved. They wouldn't have been saying that about me, Con. And I cannot wait because you've messed me around and you've spoken about me in the public like this. I cannot wait to get my hands on you and smash that glass jaw to pieces, let go of these chocolate brownies as he calls them. Here is the problem, however. He was struggling to make weight from back in 2018. This fight, from what they're speaking about, will be at 149, just two pounds above the welterweight division. If he is incapable of making this weight, and we saw against Terence Crawford, his skill set, to an extent, was still there. The timing was superb. At points, he was outboxing Terence Crawford in those first three rounds. Terence Crawford, after the fight, said... Damn, man, your timing's amazing. Ke Terence Crawford was getting out boxed at points by Kel Brook. He looked brilliant in the first three rounds. And yet, as Khan taunted him today at the presser, he got stopped with a jab. Because what happens is when you drop your weight to that sort of level, you don't just get rid of water generally in your body that's stored in your body. You're getting rid of water to the extent where your spinal cerebral fluids, the fluids that surround the brain, are, are uh, diminished. And 24 hours isn't always enough time to replenish them after the weigh-in. Now, just like a penny in a bottle that's half empty or, say, a fifth full, if you rattle that, you're going to hear that penny bashing off that bottle. If the bottle is quite full of water, the impact on the sides isn't going to be the same. Well, by the same token, if the brain is rattling on that skull because your cerebral fluids are low, the impact's going to be greater. So the more he drains himself, the more dangerous it is and the more punch resistance disappears. 
Has Kel Brook, because of this hatred for Amir Khan, this energy of, I want to get my hands on you because I don't just... This is not just about who's the king of the British world to waste. This is not just about you running your mouth and me wanting to put you in your place. This is about the fact that you, I hold you responsible for costing me my career, my legacy. You toyed with me and you ruined my legacy. And I can't wait to smash you to pieces. And just like an auction, I want you to envisage yourself in an auction, right? You've gone to an auction and you have in your mind how much you want to pay for a particular item, a piece of jewelry, say, that you've always wanted. And you say, I'm not going to go a penny over this amount. So you place your bid and someone else bids with you. And as you get closer and closer to the maximum amount that you've put in your mind, you realize that this guy's bids are slowing down. He's a little bit more tentative now. But finally, he bids to the point that you said, this is my limit. I'm not going above that. You're noticing his tentative delays. You're thinking, you know what? I'm only going to go just one more bid. Just one more bid. So you give one more bid. But he matches it. Again, he looks tentative. So you know, you know what? This is his last bid. If I make one more bid above this, I get it. So you bid it. And you do indeed get it. Brilliant. You've got what you've always wanted. But you've now paid more than you ever intended to pay. And there could be consequences when the banks come calling in a few months from now when you can't pay back that loan. Is this what has happened with Kell Brook? Has he seized something that he wanted so much that it's actually going to be a detriment to him? Had this been at 154, I have no shadow of a doubt in my mind, to be honest with you, Kell Brook would have come out victorious. At 149, what does that mean? There is a reason Amir Khan decided that this would be the weight. Don't buy any of this stuff about, you said you'd come down to world to weight. So what? What, you think that's just mind games? This isn't mind games. This is Khan knowing he could potentially weaken Kell Brook. And has Kell Brook's hatred for Amir Khan, the yearning to get the revenge, has that backfired? Is this a trap that his passion has led him to fall into? Let me know what you think about all the things we've spoken about. Thanks for watching, ladies and gents. Chat to you soon. Take care and God bless.